Welcome back to our final lecture in the neurology section. In this one, we're going to dive into headaches. Most of this should be a review from your step one. So uh, let's dive in and start, of course, with migraine headaches. Now, when it comes to the migraine headache, many patients will report a prodrome or early precursor to the migraine episode. These could be either emotional states or physical manifestations. So it's really important that you keep an eye out for this detail in a vignette. Common prodromal symptoms are things like yawning, feelings of depression, irritability, and or euphoria. Now, a migraine aura is a set of symptoms that may precede or be present during the migraine episode. These can include both sensory and motor disturbances. The migraine aura can include a loss of senses, so a lack of hearing, sight, or sound, a feeling of numbness, a feeling of tingling. It can also include the presence of visual disturbances, like seeing bright lights or shapes. It can also present with hearing ringing noises that aren't really there. Now, about a quarter of individuals with migraines will have the presence of the migraine aura, and it can often be difficult to distinguish between migraine aura and other conditions like a TIA or a stroke, so just keep that in mind. Now, visual and sensory auras involving numbness and tingling are your most common, so watch out for those. Now, you always want to watch for triggers because their avoidance is a really important component of management. Now, commonly, uh, triggers that are associated with migraines include stress, menstruation, fasting, even weather changes. There may be more, certain foods, certain smells, but those are some of the big, more common ones. Now, the characteristics of a migraine headache will include being unilateral, severe, pulsating, can last from 4 to 72 hours, may include nausea and vomiting, photophobia, phonophobia, and possibly allodynia, which is the experiencing of pain with activities that should be painless, like combing your hair or uh, rubbing up against a bed sheet, things like that. Now, the diagnosis of migraine is made after the patient has had at least five headaches lasting four to 72 hours that have had at least two of the characteristics we went over, such as being unilateral, severely painful, pulsating, as well as made worse with daily activities like walking or climbing stairs. The migraine attack should also include at least one symptom of photophobia, phonophobia, or nausea or vomiting. Now, treatment consists of preventative care which behaviorally includes avoiding any trigger if it's been identified, but also medications like beta blockers, tricyclic antidepressants, or anticonvulsants. Acute migraine attacks can be treated with NSAIDs, tryptans, antiemetics, as well as calcitonin gene-related peptide antagonists known as CGRPs. All right, let's talk now about the tension type headache. This type of headache is also a clinical diagnosis, and characteristics you want to keep, keep in mind when it comes to this type of headache, including it being bilateral, mild to moderate, uh, with a characteristic tightening, pressure, fullness quality, and it can last for minutes to days. Now, it's also possible that you do get photophobia or photophobia with this headache, but not likely both, as well as pain on palpation of the pericranial muscles, meaning muscles of the head, neck, or shoulders. Now, the diagnosis here is made when the patient reports at least 10 episodes that lasted from 30 minutes up to one week. The patient should also have no symptoms of nausea or vomiting which can help you distinguish between this and the migraine headache. So make sure you watch out for that detail in a vignette. Additionally, at least two of the following signs should be seen. You should see pressure, which is a tight quality. Uh, you should see it being bilateral. It should only be mild to moderate in severity, and it shouldn't be made worse with daily activities. So what this means is that a migraine headache, someone's going to want to go into a dark room, turn off the lights, and not do anything. The tension headache, you can probably still go about your daily activities. It'll suck a little bit because you don't feel good, but you can still do it. Now, all of these are already distinctly di different uh, features from migraine. Now, even though the photo or phonophobia is possible, since you won't see both, that can really help you distinguish between the migraine and the tension type headache. Now, the treatment of a tension type headache includes preventative care with TCAs and acute treatment with NSAIDs as needed. All right, let's talk about cluster headaches next. Next, This is a clinical diagnosis that's based off of symptomology. So cluster headaches will last anywhere from 15 minutes up to three hours, and the patient will have severe unilateral orbital, supraorbital, and or temporal headaches. Now, frequency can range from one headache every other day up to eight daily with either one or both of the following findings, a sense of restlessness, agitation, or autonomic symptoms ipsilateral to the pain, such as lacrimation of the eye is a classic finding. So when you, compare the, when you compare this to the migraine where the patient tries to isolate themselves and avoid activities, patients with a cluster headache will oftentimes pace or rock back and forth in bed as a result of the pain. So it's extremely painful. 
Now, the autonomic symptoms that I mentioned earlier, the lacrimation, you may also see nasal symptoms like congestion or rhinorrhea, uh, eye symptoms like I mentioned, the lacrimation, but you could also see conjunctival injection, ptosis, edema of the eyelids. You may also see facial sweating. The patient will need to have at least five of these episodes before we make a diagnosis. So there's no imaging and there's no labs required here, just like in the case of the migraine or the tension. However, and this is important, if you see focal neurologic deficits or signs or symptoms that indicate the neurosystem's affected and you're concerned that maybe there's a space occupying lesion, then imaging is mandatory. Now, I don't want to confuse you with headaches, but you need to be on the alert for something that might look like a classic headache, but it's also associated with neural findings. So keep that in mind. Now, preventative treatment for cluster headaches includes daily verapamil, and for acute pain management, oxygen is going to be the preferred modality. Now, if O2 alone fails, we can add in a triptan medication. All right, let's move away from the primary headache disorders. Let's go over some other causes of headache that you need to be aware of for your exam that we haven't already covered in other lectures. Let's first start with idiopathic intracranial hypertension, aka the pseudotumor cerebri. So this is a condition that affects typically overweight females of childbearing age. Symptoms include headache, visual obscurations, which are transient losses of vision lasting only a few seconds, as well as pulsatile tinnitus, which patients uh, typically describe as hearing a rushing of water or wind. Now on physical exam, the really important detail you want to look for is papilledema. When you hear headache and papilledema, you need to be thinking idiopathic intracranial hypertension. It needs to be at the very top of your list of differentials. Another important finding you want to keep an eye out for is cranial nerve 6 palsies. This can present with uh, limitations in abduction of the eye that would result in a patient suffering from peripheral visual field loss. There's no imaging that's diagnostic for this condition, but an MRI with magnetic resonance venography can be performed, and if done, would show empty cella and flattening of the posterior aspect of the globe. The magnetic resonance venography is, per is performed because we are looking and trying, looking for and trying to detect cerebral venous thrombosis, which could present with similar symptoms as idiopathic intracranial hypertension, but of course would be due to something else. The only lab abnormality here that you would see would be an elevated opening pressure on lumbar puncture, but you're not going to see any, uh, any specific abnormalities in the CSF analysis itself. Now, diagnosis is made based on the presence of signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure without other neuro deficits or altered levels of consciousness, with an elevated opening pressure on LP, but normal CSF, as well as no other cause of intracranial hypertension seen on MRI with MRV. Now, treatment includes stopping the use of tetracyclines if they're being used that has been implicated in a worsening disease, as well as counseling on weight loss. Patients should also take daily acetazolamide and naproxen as needed for headaches, and if visual loss is severe or worsening, Surgical intervention with the placement of a CSF shunt or optic nerve sheet fenestration is warranted. The last thing I want to touch on here is a headache associated with a brain tumor. The problem here is that there's a huge variety of presentations for patients with a brain tumor, but the vast majority of patients that have headache symptoms are going to have one of those primary causes of headache that we discussed and don't need any extensive workups. But here are some of the symptoms that you want to be on the lookout for and consider as being red flags for the possibility of a brain tumor associated headache. The first is a new onset of headache in a patient over 50 years of age. Now, headaches can be unilateral, they could be bilateral, they could occur in any area of the head. So, location of the headache would not be too helpful in determining if it's a brain tumor causing the headache. Another important factor that we want to consider is if the onset happens at night or early in the morning, as well as worsening pain with a Valsalva maneuver. Progressively worsening headaches, as well as headaches plus systemic symptoms like fever, fatigue, or new neurological signs like seizures, cognitive dysfunction, or focal weakness should warrant a further workup for a brain tumor as well. Now, one thing you want to keep in mind is that it's rare for a patient to present with a headache and no other neuro symptoms if they have a brain tumor. In fact, less than a fifth of patients have just an isolated headache. Okay, so that's something really telling in a vignette that you want to keep an eye out for. Some studies have found that only 2% of patients present with headache alone if they have a brain tumor. Um, if a patient has any of these symptoms we've just discussed, you always want to do neuroimaging to rule out a brain tumor or some other serious etiology. Now, the diagnosis of a brain tumor is made definitively with a positive tissue sample, and this sample can identify if this is a primary cancer or if it's metastasis. 
If another source of cancer is suspected, a CT of the chest and abdomen should be performed to help us identify the source. And the treatment is going to include the use of steroids to decrease uh, peritumoral edema if the patient has elevated ICP, and then individual management with radiation, chemo, and surgery. That would just be based on the tumor grade, uh, type, location, etc. Okay, let's do some content review questions. I will put 20 seconds on the clock. I'm sure you'll need more time here, so hit that pause button and then come on back. Correct answer here is C. Next question, 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button and then come on back. Correct answer here is B. And your final question, I will put 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got it, come on back. The correct answer here is D. All right, that is the end of this lecture. That is the final lecture in Neuro. I will see you guys in the next topic.